Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Uh, I need to start with uh, just a quick shout-out. To? To Clark. So this is a shout-out to Clark. Kent? Well, I bet he wishes. I bet. Clark is uh, Clark is a, a buddy of my son's who lives a couple of doors down and across the street. And by way of, of their conversations, he's discovered our podcast. And he has been quoting the Outbreak show all day long <laughs> in it while playing water balloon fight in our front yard. While she, while she sucked on his face. 
<laughs> yeah, that was a popular line. So shout out to That's Clark. So uh, glad you found the show. I'm sure, buddy, that you have not seen uh, many of the movies that we've talked about, but I hope you are able to truck through the back catalog. Glad Taxi you're here. Taxi driver's next. <laughs> Uh, uh, how you, how you feeling about Jason Bourne? How has it aged on you over the last couple of days since that since that show? And I promise I won't say anything. I you know I mean it's about about the same. I mean I felt like it was entertaining enough. Um, it's just you know thinking about it afterward is where all the disappointment comes in, and I still feel relatively disappointed by it. Um, I don't know. I'm. It may be something that I revisit down the road, and maybe I won't be quite so harsh on it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe I still will. I'm, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like they had created such a great trilogy. Um, I mean, I haven't even gone back to legacy, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, I mean, maybe I will, if the, if I do, I feel like I'd definitely hit legacy before I jump into Jason Bourne again. Yeah. I, I think that it's, uh, I was obviously uh, too wired up on that show, but I, it, in my opinion, hasn't really changed. I think you just said it, though. I think my problem is one of expectations. I wanted to love it as much as I really do love the rest of the series, and it just I didn't, and so I got mad and and took my ball and went home. <laughs> I mean, you know, I watched the movie and then I took my ball and went home. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that was a that was a, a fun show, and it was it was good to get on and scream and yell about about sadness. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm, and I'm glad we were able to do that. JJ did a good job, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he did yeah, great. He did I wonder if job. there will be another uh, Born film. You know, there wasn't going to be, and then there was. And now yeah. I'm curious if if Greengrass and Damon will find a way to. Uh, to do it again, if or I should say, if Universal will find a way to persuade them with enough cash to come right, back and do it again. Right, right. Well, and and it made enough. You know, it's already made enough cash to be somebody's got to be nodding and winking in that direction. I would think so. Yeah, in this day and age. What about mm-hmm. you? You got any other news? Um, nope. You haven't you haven't seen anything else? You haven't you haven't done anything else? Uh, probably. <laughs> it's been a week. <laughs> Man, that kind of a week. That's all right. I say we tell people where we're from. Where are we from? This is the next reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that over there is Andy Nelson. Hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, we're continuing our dis- series on disease films with Joss Whedon's 2005 film Serenity. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or join us on YouTube. You and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And you all gone on this boat for different reasons, but you all come to the same place. You're here for The Next Reel's Instagram, hashtag Pony Prize, hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. And we aim to misbehave. And with that, let's head on over to Haven, a.k.a. Scotland, and check in with Games Master a.k.a. Shepherd Stephen Smart, to see who won this week. Hey guys, this week's movie was Scarecrow from 1973, starring Gene Hackman and Al Pacino. Congrats to at the other Scotty who guessed it on Image 2. You are entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday. So thanks guys and see you later. We've got a blot spot uh, on the books, and it feels like uh, maybe uh, or did we over did we overthink outbreak, Andy? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I can see where Ben's coming from. I don't get it. All of the sudden, it was like you guys were looking for some kind of real life, accurate depiction of a viral pandemic. Outbreak is like a classic disaster movie, and I think it's a great example of one. The acting is enjoyably over the top, and the action film finally is crazy, but so much fun. You were disillusioned on a rewatch, and I was reminded how much I like this movie. Your rank 237, my rank 39. Mmm, that is, we, we part in a yellow wood. <laughs> is it yellow? Oh my goodness, yellow and quite- jaundiced. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite a parting. I stick by uh, my opinion of the film. Uh, yes, I understand your point. It, it did seem like maybe we were looking for a contagion type of film. Um, I don't have a problem with a, a really fun 
uh, you know, classic disaster movie that happens to be a, a viral pandemic. However, I just felt like too many people were making dumb decisions for me to enjoy it. If they were making smarter decisions, I would have really gotten into it. I, uh, for me, uh, it, the split comes about halfway through. And the problem is that it is a film that is multi-tonal, that they start with one kind of vision of what the film is going to be. And it changes so dramatically and becomes so stupid because of the reasons you have outlined. I just can't get behind it anymore. What's most interesting to me and what we don't usually read, Ben has started including his wins and losses in his rankings on Flickchart. And uh, I am, I have to say, I'm, a, I'm stunned that Outbreak... Uh, well, it loses to Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, I think, rightfully so. But it wins against Room. I know. That's Ugh. the one that stuck out to me. <laughs> ben, I feel like it just, was just like a prison shiv uh, <laughs> with that with that one. That was, that, that was, that's a tough one. No, tough yeah, one yes, to swallow. It yes, it is. Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. You got it. You got to go first. I'll go first. I am talking about The Hollers, John mm. Krasinski's film. Yes, that's right. John Krasinski, who is a fantastic, fantastic actor, who is, has directed a few things, starting with uh, Brief Interviews with Hideous Men back in 2009, which uh, was a comedy drama that I don't know anything about, but is based oh. on David Foster Wallace story. You haven't seen it? No. Oh, okay. It's you got to be in a mood, but it's quite good. Is it? Yeah. No, you got to be in a special place. No, that's one. I actually I own that one. That's one that I liked enough to have in the collection. Interesting. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll put it on my list. Yeah. So he did that, and then he did a uh, an episode of The Office. But other than that, his directing uh, library is relatively small up until this, The Hollers, uh, which he's directing and starring in. This looks great. He's playing John Holler one of the uh, titular characters, um, and his, it's about his family. He returns to his small uh, hometown after learning that his mother has fallen ill and is about to undergo surgery. We, of course, have John Krasinski as that son who returns home, hooks up with his brother, Charlotte Copley, who looks great in the film, and his parents, Margot Martindale and Richard Jenkins, who both also look great. And then, of course, there's his ex-girlfriend, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. There is the uh, his mother's nurse, who also happens to be dating his ex, uh, played by Charlie Day, and his pregnant uh, girlfriend, Anna Kendrick. It uh, looks great. Everything about it looks really uh, quirky. It looks like a really just an, a nice family comedy. And, you know, I really enjoy these sorts of films, especially when you've got a real solid sense of the people here and you've got a good sense of the family. And this family dynamic with this group of people here uh, just looks great. And I'm excited to see everybody in here. And even Josh Groban turns up as, uh, as a character in here. So everything about it just looks like it's going to be appealing to me. What would you think of it? Oh, I, I'm right with you. This this looks like it sets the absolute perfect tone for me and um i love charlie day so much and just seeing him in another film excites me um but he is he's one of the funniest actors that that i think is working right now and he's not in enough stuff and he's um, got a funny voice yeah <laughs> yeah i mean he just yes he, he's just funny he is the absolutely beleaguered uh co-owner of the bar and it's always sunny in philadelphia which is another show i just can't get enough of it's it's so wrong it's right that here, show, here. Um, but uh, no, I'm with you. This is this looks like one that that I want to uh, find. It's in the vein of kind of the way way back and uh, 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 what was the the one about the road trip to the dancing co- or the modeling competition that I like so much. Uh, uh, Sun uh, sunshine, uh, sunshiny, sunshine, <laughs> sunshine. It's, it's all Ruby. shiny. I <laughs> in a van. <laughs> Come on, I know you know it. Of course I do. Uh, a little Miss Sunshine. Little Miss Sunshine, yes. Jeez. You <laughs> threw me. I don't know why. <laughs> Got me all nervous. It's like a game show. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> don't you uh, don't you get the, feel, the feeling uh, that kind of feeling like there's this there's this certain kind of family journey movie, and in this one it doesn't look like they're going very far, but it feels very much like uh, like that kind of a film. I like those very much. So I'm absolutely about it. when's it hit? Absolutely, this film is going to have a release here in the U.S. It started uh, in uh, Sundance and a few other festivals, but uh, at the end of August, actually later this month, August 26, it will be opening a day after it opens in Singapore. Those are the only release dates thus far. All right, I'm in. My trailer, Andy, I am conflicted about my trailer. Uh, I am doing uh, uh, The Great Wall. This is, I, I didn't even know this was happening until, of course, I went to see Jason Bourne, and this was one of the trailers that, that uh, dropped last week. This is Matt Damon's next new film, uh, directed by Zhang Yimou, Yimou uh, and Zhang Yimou, uh, Zhang yeah. Yimou, yeah, and uh, written by uh, uh, Carlo Bernard, Doug Miro, and Tony Gilroy. It is and story story. Max Brooks has credit story there. He does. Yeah, Max Brooks, Edward Zwick, and Marshall Hershkovitz. Uh, this is uh, it's an interesting one. I saw the trailer and I was baffled. Right, it is the story of uh, the the building of the Great Wall, the mysteries revolving around the Great Wall. Uh, you know, was it built to protect uh, the this great land from? You know, from who, you know, who was attacking the Great Land? Well, it turns out it was giant dragons and uh, fire-breathing dragons. And so it's it's a big special effects giant thing. It turns out, did you know this, Andy? It is a an adaptation of the Great Wall of China by Franz Kafka. What? Yes. This uh, was uh, an allegory, according to Wikipedia, it's an allegory to European isolationism and exclusion in spite of taking place in China during the Song Dynasty. Now, you can find the short story. I have a link to the short story, The Great Wall of China by Franz Kafka, translation by Ian Johnston, and it is not very long. It, it is uh, uh, 11 short scroll pages uh, on the net, and I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes if anybody's interested in reading it. As I read through the first four or five pages, um, I get it. I get how they could how they could think that this is a thing. I don't know how it's going to how it's going to roll out, but uh, I get how this might have have come to the point of adaptation. I am fascinated by the decision of filmmakers to take uh, an allegory of European isolationism that is ironically set in China and taking it literally. Uh, I think that's an interesting choice, maybe not a good one, uh, but we'll see. What do you th- what do you think? What's your what's your position? I I couldn't quite figure out what to expect when I watched this trailer. I was like is it being a historical drama or is it being like a supernatural thriller like what was the direction it was going it kind of had a little hint of both in it um i'm not really sure what to make of it obviously there's a lot of criticism and backlash going on right now with the whitewashing by having matt damon and willem dafoe uh in the film and uh you know it's that whole issue that you get when you cast these white guys in these movies um so i that's uh that's something that uh you know, I, I'm curious to see how they fit into the story and to see what's going to be going on there. I guess it's actually the most expensive film ever being shot entirely in China. Um, so that's uh, an interesting That is. Footnote. Looking at looking at the production, um, uh, you know, the production, the companies behind the production, it, there's a lot of China money in this movie. Yeah. A lot. Big Matt Damon name, even bigger Chinese money. The thing that I think that that um, gives me hope uh, for this film, um, I, I love that we mentioned, you know, on the on the um, Jason Bourne episode, uh, Tony Gilroy is uh, is one of the people involved in the script, which interests me. But I think what I um, gives me the most hope is that Zhang Yimou is directing this. Um, I think Zhang Yimou is an incredible, incredible filmmaker. I'm secretly plotting to uh, to get a Zhang Yimou series into our show one of these days because <laughs> there's so many great films to talk about, um, which would be a lot of fun to do, um, especially some of his early ones in oh, the 90s. Yeah, There's yeah. a great period in the 90s. But um, I, I think that he certainly has shown some uh, kind of big action spectacle chops um, starting in the 2000s when he started making films like Hero and House of Flying Daggers and right. Curse of the Golden Flower and things like that that were just big, uh, you know, uh, fun period films. And uh, this looks like it's going to be um, 
a lot of that. And if anyone can kind of get past some of the uh, the whitewashing going on in the film, I'd like to believe that that Zhang Yimou can do that, do it. So, so I, I I count myself as looking forward to this one, even though it still perplexes me. <laughs> yes, I I think it should, and that's probably fine. Let it be perplexing for a little while. I think it's it, it's tough to watch uh, and and not be a little bit spoiled because of how I felt about Born. Um, but I'm going to try and keep an open mind uh, and keep an open mind as to how they manage to shoehorn these uh, big American names into this great big Chinese movie. Um, we'll see, we'll see. But it looks like it's going to be a pretty big splash come February 17th in the U.S. And uh, it, it's going to open, it looks like, uh, September 29th in Israel, probably a festival. December 16th, we've got a holiday release across Asia uh, the last three weeks of December. It, it will finally reach us uh, again in February. So uh, there you go. So China, it will be hitting in uh, in December then, huh? Yes, China, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Russia in January. Uh, Brazil, Netherlands, Bulgaria in early February, and then it wraps up in uh, uh, Europe, uh, Denmark, UK, Sweden, the very end of February, France, and early March. There you it go. makes me wonder if in China they're pushing, since it is such a big Chinese film with the Chinese director and everything, if they're kind of pushing this to be one of their big um, award sorts of films. Yeah, yeah, possibly. I'm curious. Yeah. yeah, should be interesting. Definitely. Dear Buddha, please bring me a pony and a plastic rocket. Y'all got on this boat for different reasons. But y'all come to the same place. So now I'm asking more of you than I have before. As sure as I know anything, I know this. I am to misbehave. Where are you hiding, little girl? The Alliance wanted the reason they shouldn't have sent an assassin. Every minute you keep River Tam from me, more people will die. This was your fault. I don't murder children. I do. The Alliance has gone to enormous trouble to find new friends. You'll know what it is you're carrying. Serenity Andy 2005, uh, written and directed by the great Whedon the Great. How about that? The, the, great, Whedon, Whedon, the, the great. great Whedon the Great. The Great Whedon the Great. Stars uh, Nathan Fillion, Gina Torres, Alan Tudyk, uh, Marina Bakaran, Adam Baldwin, Jewel State, Sean Mayer, Summer Glau, Ron Glass, Chiwetel, IGO4, David Krumholtz, Michael Hitchcock, and Sarah Paulson. Those are the ones I care the most about. That's all That's of them. it. Just That's pretty much all of them. <laughs> and all the other people who are great. This is, of course, a, uh, a it's, it's a closing chapter. We'll call it a closing chapter to the, uh, the short-lived series uh, originally aired, 12 of 14 episodes. All 14 have been uh, officially released in, on streaming and DVD, of course, by now. And um, this was a, a, a movie that should not have existed uh, by all rights. It's a movie that, after the show, was canceled and canceled so hard and so fast uh, I think uh, a, a lot of people were pretty surprised that uh, when they started seeing trailers pop up for Old Serenity. What do you think? I this is Serenity. I mean, I love it. It's 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 hard to uh, it was hard to say goodbye to the Firefly uh, family, and it was great that they got to make a feature film as a way to finish the story and uh, kind of complete that closing chapter that uh, all the fans were waiting for. I love it. I think this film uh, did a great job of wrapping everything up. As, uh, as, as sad as elements within the film can be, um, I yeah. really do love this film. I, I do too. I, it, it, you know, it's, it's funny from a production standpoint, or, or at least from a, a cultural acceptance standpoint of cultural acceptance, it's interesting that it follows such a similar track to early Star Trek, right? You know, you get that first season, and uh, it doesn't do very well, and it's canceled, and the fans love it, and they make a movie, and suddenly it turns out there's a franchise in, in there, uh, and it, it wasn't what anybody really expected. And here we are, this is the 50th year of Star Trek. I have to admit, I was hoping that Serenity would get the same sort of treatment, that it would get the same sort of acceptance, we have as yet to see uh, a sequel to Serenity, the film. It is unfortunate. Uh, it, with the film, for whatever reason, it managed to connect to, I mean, obviously the fans were out there and they were rabid for it and they devoured it. Unfortunately, when you're working with bigger money, um, and, you know, I... I think that the marketing for this film was a little tricky for Universal, and I, I don't think that they found the right way to actually market it to 
get a wide audience um, to come and find it. And because of that, the film really ended up struggling at the box office. Such a which shame. Is, I know. It's so sad. Yeah. Uh, the the film it's in our disease series and when we started talking about it it was it it was tough to remember why this could be a disease movie but uh, there is disease in here and it is human rot disease it ends up being kind of a a sub a subplot or an, uh, or a, uh, what do you call it it's kind of the overarching uh, you know plot of the film but it's it's, it's kind the of MacGuffin. a smaller part it's the MacGuffin right there it is it's the MacGuffin. Uh, the the disease part is that the uh, the the scientists, human scientists, who were terraforming these other worlds to expand the human the human race uh, into space, a chemical that they put into the air purifiers turns out it turned I think they said what like ten percent at ninety percent of the population it turned them into uh, numbed to death. Uh, people they didn't care about eating anymore they just laid down and died and 10 percent they turned into crazed maniacs uh who wore the skin of their conquests on their faces and and they just traversed space hunting and killing and eating other people really grotesque to to that extent it kind of reminded me of the most recent iteration of i am legend with will smith yeah where it's you know it's our people it's a, a scientist trying to help people trying to come up with a cure in this case the cure for cancer unfortunately that cure ends up turning everybody to uh, creepy vampire creatures except for one or more people. yeah right uh, this is uh, essentially the same sort of thing they are trying to come up with this this cure for uh, for violence and and to make people you know, kind of happy all the time, right? Yeah. And they're trying to create for the government who, you know, the the alliance that is trying to uh, take control over the entire galaxy and, and just make everybody happy. They're trying to come up with something to kind of stop all of the uh, um, the fighting. And in turn, what it did is, is, is it created a lot of people who are really uh, docile to the point of death and then a small percent of these violent violent uh, beings and it's it's an interesting thing to look at how people may decide to um, make a change like this and play god essentially and what happens because of that and and the the devastation that is wrought on on the universe because of it isn't that the interesting story too? Like what right it's funny in on a meta level that that we have this population that believes it is within their right to numb the population to the point of being so docile. Like that that they would even attempt to put this kind of chemical into the air thinking that it was the right thing to do. There is a second sort of cultural storyline in here that I really like and that's in in the way we numb ourselves, right? It's the use of of television that this idea that television can be such an insidious element to a population in one case we have uh we have river who is through television through television and being monitored through television in this future where where the television's kind of watching you uh you know she can be incited to horrific violence and indirectly inspiring inaction we have mr universe is kind of at the center of everything and all he does is watch 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 everything and he is lives alone on this big round couch with a robot woman like he is the ultimate couch potato right uh, just taking in signal uh and uh kind of inspired to to no direct action on his own but kind of being a being a channel uh, and, and i think those two things right the the sort of government and the populist relationship and the media and the populist relationship are the two things that really stick out to me in this film and i think that makes it a really interesting sci-fi romp another element of the government and populist uh, element that i think we also have to uh, mention is the fact that the government tries to cover it up, right? Right. I mean, that's right, right. that's the whole. That is the crux of our story. That is why the government is after River Tam, because as we learn at the beginning, this doctor who had been monitoring her was uh, basically showing her off to some parliament people, and she was kind of absorbing information from their heads. One of the things she learned was this whole story about Miranda, this planet where they were doing these experiments, and basically accidentally created the reavers of course they've tried to 
kind of shut that entire thing off. Except now River's out there and has this information, and now they're trying to get it to stop her and to stop these people from releasing that information to everybody. And of course, that's the whole thing here is you can't stop the signal. You mm-hmm. you have to get the information out to the people and let them know. So it, that that side, I, I like how that ends up tying into the media and the masses side of the story and how media ends up being the way to disseminate that information to everybody and to kind of let the truth out, so to speak. So um, right, it's, right. it's an interesting way where those, those, the, those two parts of the story converge. Life finds a way, Andy. It's practically Jurassic Park. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Um, uh, Joss Whedon, this is, uh, you know, I feel like fans of Joss Whedon, fans of the show already knew what to expect when it comes to Joss Whedon writing this film. Uh, he has a singular gift in writing for the ear, don't you think? Yeah. And he even admits it. And he admits that he, um, loves to hear himself write, as he says, where he ends up putting way too much dialogue in and ends up having to cut it back quite drastically because there's so much, um, there's so much of that witty dialogue in here. And, and these characters just come to life because of the dialogue. I mean, it's just, they're fantastically written. And I found that, uh, upon this rewatch, just how good he is at, um, not just balancing his characters, but also finding a way to weave the story together and to move it. And I was, I'm was, i always impressed with the opening of the film where we jump across three different stories, essentially, as we kind of glean the information, kind of setting us up. We start with the, it's almost like a voiceover setting us up of the history of this society and how Earth is dead and, and we've expanded into the universe. But then we realize, oh, this is a teacher talking to a class, and we have young River Tam here learning from this teacher, and we get this great little bit. Oh, but then this is all an actual uh, uh, something in River's head as she's being kind of tortured and studied in this lab with the scientist. And then we see, oh, her brother is actually here, and he's helping her escape, and he helps her escape, and they get out. But then, oh, wait, we have stop and rewind, and now we have the operative as he is actually rewinding and looking at a hologram of their escape, and we get his side of the story and how he's actually in pursuit of her. Uh, just a brilliant way to set this story up so quickly in such a short period of time. You move through so many different levels to really get a sense of this world and what's going on. Just top-notch writing all through that, I think. This is uh, this is the the script you mentioned. He likes to. We should should note that the original draft of the script that's floating around the internet and you'll find in the show notes is 190 pages, uh, and and you can read it all. And and one of the things you'll notice is that the beginning and the end are the same. The, the beginning and the end had not changed in the from what was actually shot. I think that's really cool. It's all the talky talk in the middle. Yeah, it's everything <laughs> in the middle that's changed. Yeah, <laughs> but I think I think this is really interesting because this is based on a TV show that a lot of people never saw, and I think that Joss Whedon had a real challenge with with telling this story and the way that he structured this script. I think that what he had to do was was write a script that people who had never seen Firefly could still understand. And uh, uh, while at the same time making it uh, effective storytelling enough where people who were fans of the story didn't feel like they had to sit through kind of a whole open that kind of set you up. And that's why I think he did this, the open the way he did. So you, you get to know these characters and then you get that great four and a half minute kind of walk through the ship as you kind of reconnect with all these different players. But it's tricky because, you know, it's like, do you watch Firefly first? Can you see this without? And I think he did a good job making it for everybody. Well, what's so interesting about that is, is in hindsight, uh, you know, we've had enough people who have seen them both and seen them in different order that, that there is a, a f- strong platform for actually starting with the movie. Uh, as as the first thing that you see, and then going back and filling in uh, the, with the series as kind of a prequel. It doesn't end. The, the last episode of the first season of the show, the first 14 episodes that were shot, it doesn't end where this one picks up, right? There's right. a strange sort of overlap. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't watched the entire last episode, but I did go back and watch the last 10 minutes of it, and, and it, it's a little bit uh, of a jolt. Uh, if you're expecting it to be kind of, oh, this movie is season two. Um, 
it, it does fill in. I think that first, the first like eight minutes uh, does fill in the, the premise of the show enough that you just don't need anything else. And that's really great because so many films that, that make the jump from TV spend 25 minutes of kind of the first act is, is rebuilding the, you know, the, the universe. And this show is much more expedient than that. I couldn't help but feel that he took a lesson from Peter Jackson and how Peter Jackson did such a great job with the openings for each of the Lord of the Rings uh, films and how he had such a great way of kind of giving giving the viewers a real sense of the scope of the story and where we were yeah. in a relatively short period of time. In all three films he did. I mean, yeah. a really marvelous job with that. And I, and I think Whedon kind of, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, this came shortly on the heels of Lord of the Rings. I, I think that he might have seen that and said, you know, that's a that's a pretty effective way to kind of jumpstart the story. Truly. Truly. Uh, there, there were a couple of things that he was trying to do in here, and we've already talked about these big cultural things and the big the sort of disease arc and the conspiracy arc, government versus the people arc. Uh, but there's also a tonal arc. You know, this is very much a Western in space, and that's what we always said of kind of Star Wars, right? It's a, it's a grand Western in space. But this is quite literally a Western in space, right? It's much more in terms of costume design, in terms of language, the way it's written, this hodgepodge of sort of Western English with Chinese thrown in there and and uh, uh, which is really fun. Um, and then you have River, who is, you know, this is the the weapon, the 17-year-old kind of government-programmed weapon, and she's very much, a, a, according to Whedon, much more of a noir character. And so how do you reconcile the westernness of Mal with the noirness of River and do it in a way that isn't too jarring? Because everything about this stew of a of a story the cultural influences of the story it can be really jarring and i think it's really a testament to what he has what he's capable of to tell this story this way yeah and i think that a lot of that just comes through in the characters i mean it it ends up working as kind of this this western noir because he has the characters that feel so authentic and they feel like the they're in their skins and their skins are well lived in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. Um, He said that, you know, he had actually talked to some of his old film professors and they recommended looking at some of the old um, kind of Western noirs as, as a way to kind of find a way to kind of get into the, into the telling of the story. And he said that helped quite a bit. So um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, a, a wonderful way to create this world where it does feel very much uh, a Western where we're kind of on the edge of the development of things. And these guys are kind of, you know, living, uh, kind of making up the law as they go along almost. Uh, first shot, last shot. I I love this one because of first shot, last shot. I love this pair of first shot, last shot. And I think I love it so much that I actually want to read the, the first shot and last shot from the script. Oh, great. Can, do it. can we do that? Yes. Uh, the the first shot um, is uh, it's over a or under a voiceover, and the voiceover is uh, the actress Gina Torres, who is the part of Zoe. She is uh, she was in Mal's regiment during the the war. Uh, script opens. We see the Earth. White pops blossom on the surface. They could be nuclear explosions from this distance, but moments later, ships, huge, intricate space freighters come roaring from the surface, passing camera with a thunder of gas and flame. We hear a woman's voice. Earth that was could no longer sustain our numbers. We were so many. And from there, it cuts off into, you know, we cut out and now we're watching these ships spread off into the, into the, universe as you've already described so that was the first shot is this brown uh toned uh really it feels very dead earth uh that is clearly at war uh the final uh shot we start inside the the um uh the cabin of uh, the cockpit of the firefly or of serenity and mal is is talking to river as she is kind of running the ship uh and he has this speech he says Uh, He's talking to her about what the first rule of flying is, and he says, love. You can learn all the math in the verse, but you take a boat in the air. You don't love, she'll shake you off just as sure as as the turning of worlds. Love keeps her in the air when she ought to fall down, tells you she's hurting before she keens, makes her a home. And then River says, storm's getting worse. Mal says, we'll pass through it soon enough. And then we hit the final shot. Serenity is 
in a horrific torrential rainstorm and then burst through the clouds, exterior space. We're looking down on the storm clouds as Serenity bursts out of them, comes at us, flared by the sun behind the planet as she passes us, her firefly effect lighting up, about to shoot off into the heavens. There is a spark and a piece of paneling pops off, whips at camera, blacking out the frame. Voice over, what was that? And that's the end. Good stuff. It is a great pair because, well, for so many reasons, I love it because we've got this first shot, which is all about death and this encroaching, you know, it's zooming in on this earth that is destroying itself. And the last shot is emerging from the rain uh, and emerges emerging into this place of of kind of love and goodness and restoration uh, after this journey that these people have gone through and, and ultimately stayed together in spite of their losses. And I think it ends up being a really powerful pairing. Yeah, rain. Rain is very much kind of a representative of a rebirth and kind of you know kind of cleansing of all of that, and so it works really nicely as they kind of they're in this rainstorm and then they kind of break through into the sun and and then of course you've got the great little comedy element too that adds uh, very nicely into that with the what was that as the piece of the ship rips off, right. which just you know gives that little nod to the tone of the of the story so yeah it's it's a really beautiful first shot last shot i really enjoy um the the story told here with kind of escaping the death and then at the end it's like now they're um escaping to new life mm-hmm. and uh, in both cases you know people are leaving for for a reason to uh to find a rebirth and I, I just think at the end of this, it's, you know, you're right in there with this family as they kind of make their way out into the light. And it's beautiful. It is beautiful. It is. Uh, the, the first shot is running from something and the last shot really feels like running to something. Yeah. Uh, and I love that the last speech and I think why why I felt like it was important to at least read that speech from the script is that it it is it really, uh, uh, you know, that it was he was not afraid to write a sort of Western narrative and use the word love about this ship, right? He, he really is hanging it all out there and saying, you know, this is this is how important it is that we're honest with our, our feelings here. This ends up being a story about feelings after all, when all these characters, uh, with, with, with some exceptions, tend to be not demonstrative of their feelings. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Fillion as Mal, Malcolm Mal Reynolds. He is so... Funny, and I swear, like I, I have seen him in very few things, but um, no matter what, this is the character that I always picture. Like I feel like Mal is Nathan Fillion, and Nathan Fillion is Mal. They've just melded together as a character, as one being. What do you? So you haven't seen any of Castle? Nope, I haven't feels, seen Castle. Feels a lot like we should probably know something about Castle. I've not seen a single episode uh, of it, of its 173 episode run. It has been on for a long time. He is definitely more Castle than Mal at this point in, in volume. Um, but uh, yeah, no, he's, he's also coming up in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 uh, in uh, next year. Very excited about that. Um, but he's he is he's had a really thriving uh, television uh, and web career since this film. Yes, I mean he's very much um, keeping busy in the TV and video game worlds. I mean that's that's where he seems to uh, spend most of his time, and he pops up in things from time to time, like Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters. Uh, Monsters University, uh, you know, obviously he was in the other Joss Whedon, the little Shakespeare dip, Much Ado About Nothing. Um, but, I mean, you mostly look at his stuff and it's TV, TV, TV. I mean, he, uh, I think this, you know, it fits that he was kind of in the TV world and that's where he kind of came from for uh, this film. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, he has done other films. I personally really loved Waitress. I thought that was a fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, movie that... Um, uh, I think was uh, not enough people had seen. And I thought Slither was actually really quite funny, um, <laughs> both of which came right after this. But, I mean, he's one of those guys who, who um, I mean, I mean, he'd been around for a long time before. He certainly is still out there now. Um, he and, was uh, he was a was... cult favorite from very early. Uh, you know, he did uh, a couple of seasons of Two Guys, A Girl, and a Pizza Place, um, which was, uh, if you recall where ryan reynolds got his big start um that was their uh 
they did 81 episodes of that show, but he went from that uh, into a couple of short-lived TV series, but then to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I think that's where he connected with, uh, clearly on-screen connection with uh, the production team and Joss Whedon, and then, uh, you know, that was, he was actually in Firefly before he was in uh, Buffy, but I, I feel like that was, that was where he really got, you know, his cult status was in those two properties. Yeah, right. It's like one of those things where you enter that world with uh, with Joss Whedon, and yeah. all of a sudden, it's like that's that is what people want you to sign when they yeah. Yeah, when they track you down at uh, Comic Con or something. Right, right. He he didn't do any guest appearances in any of the Avengers things, did he? I don't, I don't uh, so. recall so. Um, I mean, I know he's done like animated stuff though. Like he yeah. did like uh, he was uh, the Green Lantern on the on an animated thing, and he was in like Justice League as as the Green Lantern. And I think he does a lot of the Green Lantern stuff for those guys. Um, but I don't think I know he was in Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, he was um, monstrous he was, like, inmate. He was one of the yeah one of the the guy that they um, beat up in that little prison. Right. The space prison. He has a, an actual character uh, in the next one. So he's going to be Simon Williams, who is uh, he's Wonder Man. He is a uh, he is a kind of a uh, super a superhero who also happens to I think be an actor or something. So it, it but he's really kind of a, a cheese ball character, and I think that's why Nathan Fillion is uh, probably the perfect person to play <laughs> somebody like Wonder Man. In fact, I think that. He, uh, gosh, I don't know why I think this, but I feel like I read something like Simon Williams is playing Tony Stark in a biopic about Iron Man in the movie or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Which uh, I I don't, I feel like I read that somewhere and I may be, I may be totally making that up, but I swear that that's somewhere out there on the internet. All right. Internet, find it. (laughs) Send it to us. (laughs) Uh, Zo- uh, Gina Torres plays Zoe, uh, and she th- is kind of similar. I mean, she was she was really busy uh, right around the time of the TV show and the film. Uh, she played Kaz in the last two Matrix films, um, and so I just remember seeing her and knowing her face as Firefly came around, and um, uh, and then obviously straight into this film. She was also before this film, immediately before she played uh, Julia Milliken on 24, day three, uh, which was, um, that was, the show was still pretty good, 24. Back at that point. Yeah. Uh, so it was, you know, she was kind of all over the place. Since then, I haven't seen a whole lot of her. Um, although, I mean, she has a large number of tv guest appearances and video game and, and animated voice work well she's been very busy with suits that's yeah where oh she that's right you're right i have spending haven't. most of her time i watched season one of that are you do you follow suits uh, no i haven't seen it i haven't seen it um and then she's popped up a couple times in star wars rebels yeah that's ketsu onyo yeah uh, I love her in this film. I, I think she brings a lot of gravitas and, um, you know, there's obviously uh, some devastation that she has to deal with. And it's very painful to kind of watch her go through that and have to find a way to kind of close herself down as she works through it. And it took me a while before I realized um, watching the film and the end of the film when she's having that conversation with Mal when they're talking about having rebuilt the ship and, the, you know, it's going to remain true and all that. Um, in fact, I don't think it was until I was listening to them talk about it that she's talking about herself there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, slow to catch on to that. But I... Um, man, it just breaks my heart because Wash, her husband, played by Alan Tudyk, who we'll talk about here next, um, is so great as Wash. And he was always one of my favorites on Firefly and favorites here. And the fact that he got killed really broke my heart. And um, I think it was, uh, it, you know, one of those things that Joss Whedon has had a lot of praise and hatred for. Um, but I think that uh, Gina really deals with that grief well in the last act of the film. Uh, Alan Tudyk's death is, it, it, it's up there with the death of uh, that horrible lawyer that we hate in law, in um, 
Yeah, where she falls down the elevator shaft. <laughs> you know what I mean? In, that uh, feels... L.A. Law. L.A. Law. It was the L.A. Law death of the rival lawyer that nobody liked at the end of that season. And he's saying goodbye to her and the elevator doors open. There's no elevator there. And she walks in and falls to her death. And it happens so fast, so shockingly, that you're you're laughing, you're crying. It's it's the whole thing. And uh, that's what it, it... It's a little bit like that, uh, with the exception being that we liked wash in the film we liked it i think joss whedon has really has the the corner on on killing sympathetic characters uh when needed uh, in this case he was killed because he was one of two characters who could not commit to a sequel when he signed the contract and so uh they knew he was going to die uh when when they started um it was it was contractual so it was just a about uh you know the the machinations of how uh, how are you going to make it impactful? How are you going to how are you going to make it matter and not seem weak? I think what what um, ends up happening, I think when Whedon has Wash die right there at the hands of the Reavers, it really I, I, we had already seen um, uh, we had seen Book die, and we knew that the Alliance was bad uh, or they could do bad things, particularly the operative in the pursuit of stopping River. But I think what uh, the nature of the way that Wash ends up dying, because um, he's so loving, he's got the greatest comedy, and, and he's kind of right at the height of kind of finishing his little comedy, uh, you know, <laughs> he, he, payoff, really. Yeah, uh, he's with just whole leaf on the wind. He just landed the ship in the middle of a crazy battle. Like that was a yeah. huge win for him. And he's got his little I'm a leaf on the wind. And it's it's just awful when he dies. And it just, what Whedon does is he tells you that we're no longer safe, right? And I think that's a really um, difficult thing for a writer to have to do. And But it's a, it's a powerful tool that they have. Because if all of these people kept living, we really wouldn't ever have to worry about them. It's the, it is the it is one of those issues that they're always going to suffer with all of the Marvel films because we know Iron Man's not going to die at the end of one of the movies. Right. Um, but because that because of Wash uh, getting killed here, all of a sudden now we're like, oh, wow, we, we don't know. We No longer do we feel safe. Any of our characters, if, if he'll kill Wash, he could potentially kill any of our characters. And, and we do end up losing... Um, uh, well, we come close to losing some more characters, and it's it, but it, you don't know. It's like, oh my gosh, is Simon gonna die now? It's it's really interesting, and I, I like that Whedon did that. I mean, it's a difficult choice, but uh, uh, yeah, you know, you know uh, though it's interesting. I think uh, Joss has been betrayed by his own strategy here because the, you know, get to Avengers, and I remember seeing Avengers, and when Clark Gregg's character is killed it is again surprising shocking he was a likable character he was a support character that we all you know we all kind of he, he seemed like just the guy that we've known for years right he's been hanging around supporting and growing shield for years and then he is killed um but then they brought him back they found yep. a way to bring him back in in that you know comic cheat and and i love agents of shield it's fine it, but it it betrays what you know, kind of a core tenet of what I count on for Joss Whedon, giving me those surprise, sympathetic deaths that matter. Right. Sort of lose trust, I guess. Well, I think it would have been fine if they didn't bring that guy back in. Would have been. I mean, it would have been a very different show without him. Right. Uh, But anyway. Regarding uh, Alan Tudyk, I love that he has in the last, oh, I don't know, uh, five or six years ended up kind of becoming one of those guys who is just a regular voice in Disney films. Like you look at like uh, Phil Harris and those sorts of characters, uh, those sorts of voice actors from back in the day who ended up in so many Disney films. And now Alan Tudyk has become that sort of guy. I mean, he's in a lot of other animated stuff, but I love that. I mean, he was in Wreck-It Ralph as King Candy. He ended up in Frozen as the Duke doing his uh, funny little... uh, Arrested Development Which was Chicken great. Dance. Which was great, yes. Which was hilarious. Great. He was Alistair Cray in Big Hero 6. He was in, uh, he was in Zootopia as, um, the, as Weaselton, Duke Weaselton. And then uh, and he's set to be in Moana as Hey, Hey, the Rooster. That's right. Uh, so I think that's fantastic. And I love that he's going to be uh, one of the robots, K2SO in Rogue One. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, there's another another good voice. That'll be an interesting trip. Yeah, I just, I love him. And he's just one of those guys that uh, can pop up in stuff. And I'm always excited. Uh, Tucker and, and Dale versus Evil is a fun one. I mean, you know, he's one of those guys who's just fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, Marina Bakaran, uh, when we said that we were going to be doing this show in the Slack group, JJ immediately said, just forget everything else and spend the hour talking about Marina Bakaran. <laughs> Ah, the Brazilian beauty. She's she really something. She is lovely. She's yes, really she something. Is. And she became something different when I saw Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She's oh, yes. fantastic. She uh, is great. She, she is plays great. the the prostitute in Aracera. And in the show, she hung out in the uh, in the little shuttle. It was all decked out in like velvet and pillows. And uh and there was a kind of budding want to be romance between the two of uh, Mal and Inara. And uh, here she's, you know, she finds her way back on the ship. She's not in the film for that long, uh, but it is wonderful to see her turn up. Uh, she has gone on to, I think, some bigger things, um, certainly uh, in the Marvel and, but she's in Marvel and the DC universe with Deadpool as Vanessa. And she is also uh, on Gotham, a uh, long running uh, she's the doctor in Gotham PD, the the uh, coroner, medical examiner, uh, and she's fantastic. Plus the Flash, she was in the Flash. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah, well she's as... uh, she's fantastic. She's been in a lot of stuff. I loved her in Spy. I mean, it was a kind of a bit character, but it was fun to see her pop up there. Uh, she helmed. Uh, she was kind of the uh, the baddie in V when that uh, series kind of re re was reborn, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, I I just I really enjoy watching her. I think she's an interesting actress. She's not in much that I end up seeing, but I do find myself always enjoying her. And she's awfully easy on the eyes. She is adorable. How about Adam Baldwin? Talk about adorable. Plays Jane he, Cobb. What a sweetie! What a little <laughs> sweetie a treat. that Adam Baldwin is. Uh, Jane, a, a, a great character who I think is really just he works really well in this character and he you know again joss whedon knew how to write these characters and they cast them to a t i mean he is jane he fits so perfectly with this sort of character and uh i as much as i don't think that adam baldwin and i would ever get along in a political conversation no i do <laughs> i do enjoy watching him on screen and he's one of those guys who's been around for like since i was a kid i mean I watching my bodyguard i mean for Pete's sake, Ordinary People, DC Cab. I mean, all the stuff that I was seeing as a kid. And then, you know, Chocolate War, yeah. all the way up into Predator 2, and then Full Metal Jacket. I mean, he's just in tons of stuff in the 80s. Yeah. He is, and he's fantastic and funny, and is hand to glove the voice of this Whedon character. He's just perfect. And he's still, uh, you know, you said he's very, <laughs> very involved uh, in. in he has a very strong political voice, but I keep coming back to his funnies. Like his character in Chuck was great. Chuck was a really funny show. And John Casey, uh, you know, as played by Adam Baldwin was a real treat on that show. He was, uh, and he is currently in, I don't know, is it, has it been canceled the last ship? Um, I'm not sure. I watched the first season of the last ship and it was, wow. It was, it was Michael Bade. Oof. Was it? <laughs> oh man! So uh, it takes a little, uh, it takes a little, uh, a little bit of numbing to get through it. Interesting. It's a lot of show on screen. Every frame is a lot of show. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> anyway, but Adam Baldwin is fantastic. Even in that, I I think he's great to watch. Yes, indeed. Uh, how about Jewel State? Again, embodies the character to a T. She is perfect as Kaylee and. I don't think I have seen her in anything else. I mean, I really, I don't, unless she popped up in something that I just completely uh, missed. I mean, she's just not somebody I have seen in anything, but I think that she is so good as Kaylee again, just the way that she's written. And, and she has that, um, the way the dialect, I mean, they all kind of have a dialect that mm -hmm. feels very kind of, kind of oddly old school, uh, while at the same time, uh, pretty modern, but she just says things and she has these little 
sexual innuendos or just things that she says about, you know, so, sometimes not, not, not innuendo. Yeah, not really an innuendo <laughs> at all about uh, not having anything down in her nethers. Twi- or, twixt her nethers. Twixt her nethers, which is like straight out of an old Western. Yeah. At least, uh, you know, maybe the way they spoke in the old West, not an old Western, because they would yeah, never right. have actually said that in an old Western. <laughs> right. But. <laughs> she was, you know, she was in uh, the the other thing I saw in terms of really fun, frivolous uh, sci fi television. Uh, she did a couple seasons of Stargate Atlantis, and I have to admit, I I really enjoyed that show. I had a ball uh, watching it. She was um, uh, she was in it, and so was you know who else was in uh, Stargate? Um, well, originally Miranda Bacarin did a stint uh, on the original Stargate. Uh, television show and uh jason momoa um huh. who is he was ronan dex in uh in stargate atlantis and he will be uh playing aquaman in the upcoming series. so a lot of a lot of these uh, sci-fi folks went off to spun off into big sci-fi careers uh she jewel state was in 33 episodes of that particular show and she was she was terrific and it. it was great to feel like i was keeping up with her for a little while um she's charming she's just so charming and she's got a great uh just affinity for simon and i love that little unrequited love that she has there that finally gets satisfied at the end of this (laughs) in in a really kind of creepy way as as river kind of is watching but you know it is what it is um Uh, you know i have to say so i watched this with my kids i watched serenity with my kids and um the you know i was curious i'm always curious when i watch these shows like who my kids are going to find their greatest affinity with and uh my son was is pretty quick to fall in love with with uh, jane like just the his comebacks (laughs) were (laughs) so great and 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 the lines were you know do you want to run this ship yeah and so <laughs> Nick has been doing that for me. But uh, my daughter, uh, when she saw Kaylee, and after the very first day, seeing her as an engineer, keeping that ship together, uh, she, literally, my daughter turns to me and says, I like her the best. That's so awesome. I think that's a, a great, she's a great uh, kind of role model character. I like that. And, until she starts talking about things to extra others. <laughs> You had to bring there, it back to that. You had to the, bring it back. I was hoping they were going to uh, skip the connection and the very uncomfortable moment of of and <laughs> and you know my daughter is old enough and aware enough that I don't need to really talk that much about it. She just looks at me and I I swear she says, "I think I know what that means. I don't really <laughs> want to know what that means. So we're just going to keep watching, okay?" <laughs> oh man, I dread those. Yeah, dread those. it's so fun. The best. So, <laughs> so moving on, Sean Mayer. Sean Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> he is an interesting character. So everybody in this show is shot in like reds, right? I mean, this it, on the, the crew is, they're all, it, it's a very red crew. And then we get to the Tams. And S- S- Simon Tam, uh, played by Sean Mayer in general, is shot in blues and purples. And he really represents the good-looking, handsome, he's the Alliance uh, we're well intentioned, of course. We're out to help you, kind of a character who has betrayed, essentially betrayed the alliance to to be aboard this ship, but only in the service of the the well being of his sister. Uh, and I I find that such an interesting visual contrast to watch how they how they portray him amongst the rest of the the Serenity crew. Yeah, it is an interesting way to kind of uh, separate them, also because they are um, as we come into it from this without having gone back and looked at Firefly, they really are treated uh, as separate. Mm-hmm. They uh, they are kind of, you know, we learn he's kind of keeping his um, his uh, way on the, on the ship and uh, his form of payment, I guess you could say, is taking care of them and fixing them up since he's a doctor and everything. But Mal certainly seems to have issues with him and there's a lot of animosity between the two of them. And I think that lighting... Um, trick that that the team uses here definitely helps highlight that and I like that I like keeping these guys separated where they don't necessarily feel like they're a part of the crew um, uh, right out of the gate Mm -hmm. he was uh, do you remember when you first ran into him it was probably this show. I, I don't. I haven't seen him in anything else. Looking through his list, you know, I was a huge Party of Five fan. Can I tell you that? Can I tell you the mm. truth? 
I have to come clean. I Tell loved me. I loved me some part, Party of Five. Uh-huh. That Matthew Fox, that hunky Scott Wolf. <laughs> oh, did I ever have a crush on Nev Campbell? Oh, there you go. Ah, uh, that was. Uh, I don't know, dude. The J Lo who, Jennifer Love Hewitt, J Lo J Lo who, J Lo who, J Lo who. Yeah, I loved that show, and he did. Uh, he did a half series, half season on um, on Party of Five uh, back in the early two thousands, and that's uh, I didn't see him again until Firefly, and then he's been kind of all over the place. Uh, in Serenity, he's had a lot of TV. Um, uh, he's dropped in on Arrow uh, recently. Did a couple of episodes on, of Arrow as Shrapnel slash Mark Schaefer. Uh, has done a lot of voice and, and video game work, and uh, we had Dick Grayson and uh, uh, AKA Nightwing, right? And some of the animated Batman stuff, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, so he's he's fun to fun to see on screen, showing up in these superhero things. Um, yeah, he was also in Much Ado About Nothing. Speaking yes. of the Joss stuff, so uh, and uh, of course, then we get to Summer Glau as River Tam. Who is just amazing, uh, not just because she gives a really interesting performance. Um, she, you know, certainly is kind of the emotional core of this story. And um, seeing her so emotionally kind of uh, confused and trying to sort things out and finally coming to terms with it, I think is a really nice journey that we watch her on, um, uh, both just kind of um, the way that she presents it and just the way that she deals with her emotions on screen. I think she's really in touch with that. Uh, a side of herself as an actress and it really is capable of bringing it to the screen but also because of the physical nature that she has and she's just she's an amazing dancer and she trained to do all of her own stunts and you've got some amazing fight scenes too the two big fight scenes are her as she's taking on everybody they uh they said that she ended up not only did she do most of her own stunts a lot of her stunts were modeled and choreographed after her abilities as a dancer and they went so far as to build and reconstruct and and reconfigure sets in order to allow her to do more of her crazy contortionist kicks and stands and dives and such and she's she's just delightful doing it and she is uh you know her career has come up with some uh, or has come along with some more opportunities to do more fancy stuff uh you know she did uh, i i actually didn't see any of the unit uh that but she did uh, half season on the unit uh she did uh, she was on terminator the sarah connor chronicles um and uh, was that was a physical role and of course dollhouse she did a, a stint on dollhouse which was i adored dollhouse that was another one that was so so prematurely canceled that was uh joss whedon's um uh, eliza dushku uh sort of spiritual spinoff from buffy and angel uh and it was just great and i mean I was a big fan of uh, Sarah Connor Chronicles. I thought that was a really interesting take on the uh, on that universe. I, I you know, despite yeah. some of the the failings of some of the most recent films, um, this TV show I actually felt was doing some interesting stuff, and I was actually really enjoying where they were going. And I was really kind of um, frustrated that it uh, ended, and it all it kind of just ended up leaving things unresolved, which um, really kind of always frustrates me when that happens and they don't find a way to kind of come back and finish it. True. Um, she was, she was great in the show as the Terminator helping uh, uh, young John Connor and Sarah Connor. I really just enjoyed everything that they were doing there. It just really, it was a fun addition to the Terminator franchise. We've got uh, a couple of minor characters that I just want to nod to, but the one that we, we need to focus on a, a, in a little bit more detail is of course, Chewie. Uh, Chiwetel Ijo for is the operative, the unnamed assassin. Yay, yes, go indeed. unnamed assassin. There are times it works better than others. <laughs> well, I, here's the thing. I mean, I, I think in Jason Bourne, it didn't work as well. As, I didn't think it worked. I know Tommy felt that it worked, but for me, um, it just it was a it was an underwritten character that didn't have much to do other than be bad and try to get Jason. <laughs> In this particular case, you have a really fascinating character who almost purposefully lives unnamed as this operative for the Alliance, and that's like who he is, and he is out to do their bidding. But he's like the nicest guy, and the way that he talks to you, and the way he kind of explains things. It's always done in this way where he's really kind of 
thinking about you and and caring about things. And I I really like that. And the way that he's just so factual, you know, it's like, oh, don't kill children. Well, I do when it, yeah. when I have to. And it's it's. I don't know. It's a really fascinating character, and I love that they had Chewie play this. He is um, one of the most wonderfully profound examples of just pure, straight-up evil um, that I think I've ever seen portrayed or or sort of personified on screen. Uh, Just because of how, as you say, he's so mechanical, but he's so genuine and, and really deeply pragmatically kind right and and that was what Whedon says about him he says i wanted to create a fellow so kind so decent and caring that the audience would almost start to root for him before he starts destroying everyone of course even eventually yes killing children the opening sequence when we're introduced to him is uh, truly disturbing and yet again honorable right you you know, even as you know what is going to happen, as he pulls out the sword, as he kills the two bodyguards, as he uh, numbs the doctor, when he puts the sword to the ground, and you know the doctor's going to start falling on it, and he, as he makes that that first, uh, he, he falls that, that first few inches onto the sword, he says, there's no shame in this. It's a good death. You can tell he is being really legitimately genuine and trying to do this this job with some sense of, in his way, kindness uh, and honor. And I think that is just diabolical. It's it's really creepy. Truly it's, memorable. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things that makes this character so good. It makes him such a, a, a an interesting bad guy to watch and root for. And I think that it also is uh, fascinating that we end up getting a bad guy who actually ends up kind of making a change by the end of the film. And I love the fact that he ends up, um, you know, having this conversation with Mal. And uh, of course, Mal kind of defeats him and, um, and ends his pursuit as Mal gets the, uh, gets the signal released. Um, But I love that he ends up in this place where it's like, he ends up almost a shadow of himself. And I love the way they shoot that last scene with him where you don't, there's not a whole lot to his, the definition of his image. And it, it, he really is almost like this shadow of a person now. And he doesn't, there's really nothing left for him. And he just kind of, kind of moves on past it. There's no point in being the guy who's the pursuer anymore. There's no point in being an operative anymore. I find him, incredibly fascinating yeah i do too and i don't think um i don't think joss whedon has written uh a character so evil and unique since before or since i think this was a this was a a singularity it seems like he could have in ultra oh i know you're gonna say i know what you're gonna say alien resurrection the ripley (laughs) the lip ripley hybrid alien clone there it is i knew that was where you were gonna go there it is yes yeah no you're gonna say ultron you think well i i I felt like that's where they were going with ultron they're they're trying to play you know that idea of a of a kind of that good slash bad just because it's uh of the the lack of morals and the lack of really understanding of things and uh I, I I think that it was an interesting attempt, but I don't think it worked as well. No, it did not. It it did not, but I totally see it. I, I see where I, it makes me want to redo that movie. Do over. Right. <laughs> uh the last uh, three characters I just wanted to mention. Ron Glass is uh he was a much bigger part in the in the show. Uh his Shepherd Book. Uh he also he was the other character who couldn't commit to a sequel, so he's offed. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. I do enjoy seeing him though. And it's I, I think that at least, even though um, Whedon knew that he was going to have to kill him off, he found a way to at least give him, uh, his character, a good uh, sense of purpose and uh, a few moments that he had with Mal to kind of guide him on some key points of the story. Well, and that, theirs was a, a really important relationship, you know. I mean, in terms of who Mal connects with on the show, he has a romantic dalliance with Inara, but really his his deep sort of spiritual, metaphysical, kind of psychological connection and and sort of guide is is Shepherd Book, and and that that really represents the pivot into that third act as he loses Book and and 
is finally called to action, to authentic yep. action. So uh, David Krumholtz says, Mr. Universe, he's just delightful anywhere. He is. Yep. Um, uh, he was on uh, Numbers for, for a very, very long time. He's uh, just a, a wonderfully talented uh, actor. Michael Hitchcock uh, is uh, funny and short-lived as Dr. Matthias in the beginning, and Sarah Paulson uh, at the very end as a hologram that is eaten on hologram yeah, I enjoy all three of them. I think that um, they are all fun to watch on screen. And uh, I think it's interesting that uh, Joss Whedon talks about how he likes to cast comedians in some of these uh, sorts of roles because he feels that if a comedian can be funny, which he f- views as harder than drama, um, then they can pull off some of these more serious roles. And I think all three of them do well here. Um, of course, with David Krumholtz, um, all I can really ever picture with him is Goldstein from the Harold and Kumar films, which totally. sometimes I wish that I could erase some of that from my memory because his character is... <laughs> he, there are moments that I just don't want to have to see it again. <laughs> They're burned into my brain. <laughs> yeah, they do a good so, job with those films, don't they? So thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, just briefly on production, uh, we've talked a little bit about just getting it made, the game of getting it made and getting it sold. Uh, but uh, cinematography, Jack Green uh, does just a fine job lighting this show, don't you think? It's it's really fantastic. There are just, I mean, I already kind of talked about that last um, bit with uh, with the operative, where he is almost like he's this shadow figure that's left there, and I really enjoy that. But there are so many just beautiful lighting moments all through this film. The way that he kind of creates these worlds. There's that great moment where you've got Mel backlit as he's kind of talking them into that last moment. You've got. Um, just the the shadowy moments that that end up having kind of more of a noirish sort of feel. You've got the fantastic look that they adopt when you have um, those moments where uh, River it kind of is absorbed by the the message, and she kind of goes off on her on her uh, you know fighting binges. Um, I found so much of this film just stunning to look at, and I'm just unduly impressed by Jack Green and his team, and obviously Joss Whedon, the way that they kind of crafted the look of everything here. Jack Green, uh, what a weird, just a weird collection <laughs> in terms of the kinds of films that he does. Um, you know, he goes from something like this. Uh, he did uh, Unforgiven, True Crime. Uh, so we've got some... Uh, some fantastic uh, Clint Eastwood stuff going on there and, and really iconic lighting and, and shooting work uh, to 40 year old Virgin, which is not as uh, maybe inspirationally lit, but certainly awesome films. And, and which is funny that um, they actually had to go film a, a reshoot on the set of 40 year old Virgin for this film. Uh, there was one scene, and I can't remember which one it was, but they had to um, they had to redo something in it because it just didn't kind of turn out the way that they meant it to, or they needed to get a different emotion coming across, and so they had to kind of <laughs> in one of the back rooms in the in the Best Buy you know department store type of place, <laughs> they had to kind of create this fake little uh, fake little set for. Uh, for um, Serenity, which I think is funny. That's too funny. Well, and then he goes from Serenity, and uh, it, you know we've got Are We Done Yet? My Best Friend's Girl and Hot Tub Time Machine. Andy, <laughs> <laughs> he is all over the place. <laughs> he is all over the place. This guy. Uh, so it's uh, you know it's interesting. He did a lot of of Eastwood stuff. Uh, Space Cowboys, even you loved that. It's That's okay. one word you could say you that could, would be yeah. You could not say right. <laughs> One other note with Jack Green, uh, tied into Joss Whedon, but also just the the beautiful open that they have to introduce us to all these characters and and the ship, um, that four and a half minute uh, single take. That's mostly a single take. There actually yeah. there is a wipe that they do. Um, I think it's when right before they go down the ladder into the into the um, the what do you call that the back med, part? The right? med like the, down where the cantina and the med bay well, are and the and the big uh the dock yeah the dock oh, okay bay. yeah um because that actually was they didn't have a multi-level set they had to have I, you know they kind of faked that but so there's a, a quick little 
a whip pan as it's going past Simon, I believe. And, and that kind of cuts into the second half. But it's designed to look like a single take. And I think they do a great job. Yeah, they do too. And there was that was one of the things that Whedon uh, points out is he calls out the Steadicam operator, Mark Moore, who in over 40 takes only slipped once. Yeah. But carrying a camera like that, that one slip is painful. Yeah, right. Production design, the real... The set piece of note is the Serenity ship design. Actually, uh, the the ship was designed by Whedon himself and production art designer Carrie Meyer and second unit director uh, Lonnie Perister. Uh, And um, uh, it's just a beautiful, iconic ship. It is something that, you know, the first time you see it, you really have never seen before. It's a great ship, and I love this whole Firefly class of design that they have. And I like, you know, when, when it takes off and you get... I think there's really only that one shot after it drops all those fake signals and it takes off and you get that kind of little firefly glow on its back as, as it takes off and the little spirally sparkles that all come out of it, which is just such a great look. And yeah. I, I really love this ship. It is very iconic. Whedon calls Serenity the 10th character and River's Feet the 11th, <laughs> for what that's worth. Uh, the, the mule is the hovercraft we meet in the very beginning of the um, film during the first heist and uh, says, Whedon of the Mule, I had to have a hovercraft or I would take my ball and go home. Well, that is very funny. Yeah. I need a hovercraft, too. I want one. Uh-huh. Um, stunts, the, the only note on stunts, the fights all look great, but the, the note of the stunts, you know, usually they say that they only put the, uh, the uh, stunt person with an actor, rarely put two actors together on these big stunt fights, right? And in this one, the operative and Mal on their two big fights in particular, the last one, uh, those guys... Uh, did most of that fight together. Uh, and uh, Whedon says that Nathan can take a punch in an almost extraordinary fashion. And that totally seems true to me. Yeah, Nathan liked to do all of his own stuff and all of his own falls and everything. And it, he said that it all stemmed from, I, I think it was something on one of his previous shows that he had done. And he felt like he did this fall and he felt that it uh, that he... Um, protected himself too much in his fall and it always looked fake and it always bugged him and so from that point on he did everything he could in his power to make everything look as real as possible to the point where there is a shot where uh toward the end of the fight um when he's fighting with the operative um he his you see a shot of his face as it smacks onto the plexiglass floor and they continue fighting. That shot of his face smacking onto the plexiglass floor, they did like six times. And by the time the sixth take <laughs> happened, uh, when he got up, he's just like, uh, how's it looking? Are we almost done? Did you get it? <laughs> and they, and and Joss looked over and he said he, he noticed that, that uh, Nathan's face was looking puffy and that he was actually really just slamming his face into the floor and his whole cheek just ended up swelling up and it just got so puffy because of that and the, they had to uh, shoot for a while just looking at the other side of his face because one side was so swollen <laughs> so uh that's the dedication that uh, that he had with his role oh he's good he's too good <laughs> Uh, just a, a shout out to Lisa Lasek, who uh, on this film was editor. She uh, was associate producer on Firefly, uh, and she's gone on to work on many more Whedon gigs, including, including the Avengers movies. She also worked on Community and Pushing Daisies, two of my very favorite films or shows. So, yay. yeah, she does a great job here. I think that there's a when it comes to Whedon and the uh, Whedonness of the scripts, I think that she has a good handle on how to whittle it down. <laughs> to kind of keep yeah. him reined in. Yeah, keep it moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. David exactly. Mu- David Newman on the music. Uh, I know you love this, this soundtrack score. I do. I, I think it works really nicely. I mean, he's not one of my favorite composers. Uh, however, he is in the Newman line. He's one of the many Newmans out there. Certainly has an interesting career of films and does a lot of has a lot of strange choices. I guess I would say. But uh, he, you look at his list, it seems like he just kind of takes everything that comes his way. Um, and, you know, it works. But I think he's got some really nice themes here. And I think that's what I like so much about his score. The theme for Serenity, the theme for River, all of them seem to just have this, uh, this perfect tone to them. So I really like what uh, David Newman ended up doing here. How do you find this compares with Alvin and the Chipmunks' The Squeakwool? <laughs> like I said, 
He seems to take everything that comes his way. Yes, 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 yes indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, the, you want to talk a little bit about the, the uh, digital release? I, I just found that this was an interesting uh, film. The way that it ended up getting released, they ended up... Um, I, I guess it had kind of a... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess now it's looked at as... Um, something that is a milestone. Um, it says, because the original 2K digital intermediate scans were read- readily available, um, the film was chosen by Universal Pictures to test conversion to a digital cinema distribution master of the film and to test the workflow required to create a digital cinema package. It was released on 35 millimeter, but they started actually getting these digital copies out there. And Serenity ended up becoming the first film to fully conform to digital cinema in, cinema initiative specs, marking a major milestone in the move toward all digital projection. That's so awesome. So who knew? I sure didn't. What do we know about awards? Did it do uh, Did it do anything in awards season? Well, it's not like an Oscar sort of film. Um, unfortunately, it just doesn't fit that vibe, and it didn't get the critical acclaim. Um, that being said, it did get a lot of other sorts of nominations. It did win the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation Long Form, the Nebula Award for Best Script, the Prometheus Special Award. It was named Best uh, or Film of the Year by Film 2005 and Film Focus. It was... Uh, uh, SFX Magazine said it was the best sci-fi movie of all time in 2007. So uh, that's quite a uh, quite an achievement. Um, uh, IGN gave it best sci-fi, best story, best trailer for the year. Uh, it just it ended up getting all sorts of those sorts of awards, kind yeah. of the sci the sci-fi sorts of awards. Um, and uh, Summer was nominated for a Saturn Award, and it was nominated for best sci-fi uh, of film and stuff. So it's it definitely is a a film that garnered the genre awards, even if it didn't necessarily win them, it uh, was there getting them. They uh, interesting note that there is a connection to Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, is film. there? Do you know this connection? Did you note it? I didn't. Shiny is used as a synonym oh, for good. That's right. Yeah. You go, Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> Um, I I actually like that, and the reason I want to I, I bring up that in particular is is because you know we get this great Mad Max kind of vibe uh, at, at the very end, the big climax of the whole thing. Uh, the biggest fight is when Mal leads the Reavers, he lures the Reavers into a battle with the Alliance, and it's a it's a fantastic um, you know armada on armada clash, and and the ships very much uh, feel like the cars in. Mad Max Fury Road, you know, you get this, they're just sort of constructed together out of just old sort of amped up like muscle car spaceships and they're all, you know, bloody and gross and pieced together. They're, they're, they look like, I mean, the way that there's those two that stick out in my mind, the, the, the ones that are um, ripping apart that one ship, yeah. uh, you know, it's almost like some strange design that they have where they pull ships apart so they mm-hmm. can scavenge. And then there's the one that it looks like it's about to attack uh, Serenity um, before they uh, before they blast it and head out. But it's almost it's got like, like it's those got like these big pincher like Yeah, it's like these mandibles. It's like an insect. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's about to strike. And such interesting ship design, but it totally does have a Mad Max vibe. That's really interesting. I totally had not thought of that until you said it, but now I will never be able to get that out of my head. Yeah, as you should. And shouldn't. that's a good thing. Yes, that's that a good is a good thing. thing. Well, and, and that's why the connection here is that, you know, we haven't really talked about the Reavers as kind of a, a major character uh, in the film as this kind of great big looming force. And since this, this is the Disease series, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about, about how you feel like the Reavers uh, kind of represent the, the, uh, the arm of disease in this film. That's uh, actually good to bring up. I think the Reavers, um, it, I mean, like I brought up uh, kind of initially with the whole connection to like I Am Legend and how you know, this was a, a man trying to play God and ending up creating this monstrosity of these, these beings that basically cannibalize everybody that they come into contact with and are nothing but violence and rage. In, in a way, it's almost like, uh, you know, the 28 days later yeah, zombies right. uh, on a different scale. 
you know, here they can still at least fly spaceships and, and uh, you know, get around <laughs> doing other sorts of things. I do always wonder that. I'm like, so these Reavers, they're just full of like rage and, and violence, but they don't seem to ever attack them, attack each other. You know, they, they all seem to be rather docile, um, just kind of floating around outside of, uh, out, outside of the, um, the Miranda yeah, area. Yeah, right. Um, so, but, you know, I don't know. I just, just a random little thought that's like, why don't they just attack each other or, you know, why aren't they just flying around always fighting? But anyway, well, it is, it is an interesting set of violent characters. And I, I think that it's really interesting that it is really kind of this man-made virus that made them that way. Yeah, I think so too. And I think they do a great job of bringing in that sort of instant sense of terror. The cast is, or the crew of the ship is, is reliably terrified of them. And that opening sequence during the heist, I think we get a, a really great taste of how bad they can be. So bad, in fact, that as they're about to rip apart the, the banking fellow who was trying to get on to the mule, uh, that Mal makes the choice to shoot him and kill him rather than let him come to his end in the hands of the Reavers. Like, that that makes a, a statement very efficiently, very economically in the film to set the stage for who these, these uh, you know, animals are so that when we meet them again later, I mean, we, we get, you know, a, and understand who we, who, that we were responsible for creating them. Um, it, it makes much more of an impact and, and has much more power. I really like it. I like the idea that we've created this sort of uh, zombie state out in space. And we just kind of have to live with it. There's nothing we can do with it. It was so bad, it is irredeemable. Uh, and yet, um, you know, now we just always have to kind of live in fear of our own creation. Um, I, I also like the fact that there is no effort in this film to cure them. Yeah, right, right. Right? In Insofar as this is a disease film, you said it was a MacGuffin earlier, which I think is a really great way to put it. This is not a search for a cure for a disease. This is, we created a disease, we don't know what to do with it, it's just there, and that's our torture. What's interesting, though, about it is, I mean, I guess I don't know enough of the Reaver world, but it doesn't seem like they're mentally um, competent enough anymore to, to reproduce or anything. And there, there obviously is no further creation of them because all of the drug was on Miranda and it only affected, what, like 5% of the people or something like that. Yeah, eventually, I guess it'll, they'll just die out. Yeah, but that's really it, right? They're going to be gone. So at least, at least there's that to look forward to. All right. Well, we should probably talk about the numbers. This film um, didn't do well. Unfortunately, uh, it's like I kind of alluded to earlier. It uh, I don't know if they really found the right way to release the film. Unfortunately, this is a Universal had taken it on and decided after um, after uh, Barry Mendel, I got uh, one of the heads at Universal um, kind of got her to become a fan. Uh, was it Mary Parent? Yeah, right? Mary Parent. Um, she, uh, said, let's do it. They made it. And then I think, I think what they did is they opted to release it in a way that really highlighted the, um, the fan base nature of it and got the fans excited about it. But I don't know if they ever did much work to get anybody else excited about it. That to me seems like a little bit of the issue with the way the film was released. I think it's great to get the fans excited for it. They all wanted to see it, though. Therein lies the problem because I, I mean, I don't know if I saw. Uh, I don't. I honestly don't remember how I ended up coming to this. I feel like it was through Sci Fi Channel and and watching Firefly. They had the little ads for the show, obviously. Um, but I don't think the general populace had trailers that sold it well, and hence it didn't make much money. It was released September 30th, 2005. It cost $39 million to make. I couldn't find anything as far as what the, the prints and advertising ended up. Um, but domestically, it only made $25.5 million. Internationally, another $14.8 million. All told, it did make its money back, theoretically, about $40.3 million that doesn't uh, count the prints and advertising effect of that like mm -hmm. i said so um minus the prints and advertising it looks like it at least made about thirteen thousand per finished minute adjusted um i have a feeling that that actually may be a negative once you get the p and a uh, factored in which is a shame but again that's probably why it uh 
it hasn't uh, created any steam to make a sequel. All right. Me You've too. made me sad, and we're going into ranking. <laughs> let's let's do this That's, thing. It's an anger rank. It's an anger rank. That's right. Protest <laughs> ranking. This That's is right. my this is my third party protest rank. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. That's where you'll find our account. And uh, just go ahead and uh, you'll you'll see Serenity is right there on our recent ads list. And you can uh, jump right in and rank it yourself. Let's see how we do. First up, Serenity or the long kiss good night. Serenity, please. Yes, sir. I really, I really love this movie, Andy. I do too. Okay. Serenity or Caddyshack. Serenity, Absolutely, please. Absolutely, Serenity. Serenity or the Fisher King? Ooh, it's getting tricky now. I'm going to choose uh, one Serenity to go, please. <laughs> uh, I will also say Serenity, but it's getting to a point where I'm really getting challenged <laughs> now. Because Fisher King, awfully good. It is awfully good. I agree. It is. But yeah, Serenity has some uh, some pretty cool sword fights and stuff. Okay, next up, Serenity or... Speaking of uh, Ben's choices, Room. I will watch Serenity first. <laughs> I uh, really, really love Room, but I will also watch Serenity yeah. first. Serenity or Mad Max Fury Road? Um, I'm going to say Serenity. I... I'm gosh, it's this is getting really tough and it it's really getting very difficult now. Uh I'm gonna say Serenity though. <laughs> Serenity or Doctor Strange Love or How I Learned to Stop Worrying. Oh I love the bomb. You know. Yeah, I know. This might be my new favorite film. I still have not made any commitment there. Well, it's, I it's certainly I, up there. I feel pretty comfortable if it goes up against Doctor Strange Love and loses. Uh, I still feel pretty comfortable about where it is on our list. It's number 10 on my personal list out of 976 movies. Serenity's number 10. I feel pretty good about wherever it lands in and around Dr. Strangelove. Well, I am going to say Dr. Strangelove. Uh, You have it. Take it. (laughs) Okay. Serenity or Terminator 2, Judgment Day? Serenity. I'm going to say Terminator 2. All right. We're going to roll on this one. Okay. One, One, two, two, three, three, paper. Ooh. Mm, yeah. You took it. Smarts. Serenity or seven. Little David Fincher. I'm going to say seven. I will also say seven. I know it hurts. It hurts, man. Seven is number four on my personal list, so that's, yep. that's still okay. Yeah. It's still fair. Go. All right. Well, that leaves Serenity at number six. <laughs> oh, so close. Number six. So close to shaking up the top five. Yes, it was. Man. We only had Doctor Strangelove shake up the top top five, so we've had a shake up this year. Wow! But that's nice. that is now uh, two new films in our top ten this year so far. That's fantastic. It's that crazy. feels great. That's great. That's bananas. <laughs> I uh, I love it. I love this film. I'm so glad we did it. Even shoehorning it in as a disease film seems viable after our conversation about this film. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think so. I think I think it's totally fine as a disease film. It's not a film that's focused on, hey, how are we going to cure this disease? But it is totally a disease film. Yeah. I, I, I do feel, um, I know we were kind of a little, seeming a little skeptical um, before we had gone into this. But upon rewatch, I really feel it is solidly a disease film. There is very much a core that works to that point oh, so I'm totally I, yeah. okay calling it that I, I am too and I more reflect on that every time I talk to people about hey we're doing Serenity in our disease series that's the first thing they say Serenity a disease film isn't that an interesting thing that nobody remembers this as having a disease angle to it I think that's an interesting thing it is right. it is uh, Letterboxd I'm assuming five stars yep straight totally up five straight up five stars alright alright that's it where do we go from here we are going to be uh, continuing our Chewy disease films <laughs> and uh, joining him in a dystopian future with children of men. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing this, if only because I feel like I'm totally out of line with everyone who watches movies. I feel that way too, and I'm really, really curious to watch yeah. uh, or to talk to you about this. I mean, this I think is just one of the best films that has come out in the last decade. 
Uh, I guess it's almost just over. No, I think it's right at the cusp of a decade now. Um, just an amazing film. And I know it's not been one of your favorites, and I'm really curious to talk to you about it and see where it lands for you once we're done. I have seen it once exactly 10 years ago, and I, I just don't. I mean, I couldn't even. I, I, re, I reacted to it when I saw it, and now I don't even know why. I don't even know why. Yeah. I watched the trailer, and a lot of it doesn't even look familiar to me. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what comes back. Uh, so that's next week. Um, all right, Andy, I gotta go to bed. All right, well, I have to go start a petition to get Firefly back on the air. Uh, Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always do it. Got a couple of couple of juicy one stars. Would you like to go first, sir? Yeah, these people. I just don't know. Uh, I am looking at a one star by Wu Li, who says, "Love, love, love, Firefly," which is probably why the empty shells of the characters, the ruthless butchering of the mood, and the elimination of the humor and warmth of the show, as well as Captain Mal made this so painful to watch. Whedon could have just said no instead of throwing a tantrum and cruelly punishing his fans. <laughs> that's, that's a tough Ouch. one. I feel like Wu Li might have had a thing for Alan Tudyk's character yeah. Wash. Yep, yep. Well, that, I... seems like, that seems like a bitter, uh, you killed Wash, I hate you sort of uh, sort of note. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely hear that. And I think Biggles, uh, my reviewer, uh, probably had a very similar uh, perspective. Uh, I am so very, very disappointed with this movie. I had just finished watching Firefly and was absolutely salivating to see how the writers would conclude it all. I was so sure that they would do the smart thing and keep the same humor snark romance that made this such a gem Wow, what a disappointment. The captain was humorless. Everything that him that made him so much fun was now gone, replaced by Mr. Angry. Simon seemed colorless. River suddenly became the star of the whole thing, and that totally ruined it. The character's interaction was gone. All of the quick quips had been replaced by a constant need for crashes and gunfights. It was just too damned serious. Save your money, and remember the series the way it was, because if you watch this movie... You'll regret it because of Mr. Angry. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help that. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In Season 6, our Disease Films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit. Some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? <laughs> Our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Are you calling Betty Davis big? Only in personality and force. She is a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> we talked about the entire The Godfather trilogy, of course. Iconic page to screen, even if it is just the one Mario Puzo book. I wonder if Coppola will ever make The Sicilian. We also had some Zhang Yimou adaptations with Judo and Raise the Red Lantern. Absolutely gorgeous movies. And don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. 
Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. Today. 